everyone, welcome to Ian and Friends. I am Flow Bike Senior Editor Ian Dilly. And I am Michael Sheehan, Ian's friend. Today we are going to break down what happened in this past weekend's cycle cross races. We are going to look ahead to next weekend's cross races live on flowbikes.com. And Ian and I are going to get into an argument. About the wussification of cycling, which has gone way too far. <laughs> Says the crotchety old man. <laughs> Millennial snowflake. Okay, so <laughs> last weekend we saw the DVV Yarmarket Cross and Super Prestige Gabire. Ugh, Gabre. Luckily, the return of mud in Belgian cycle cross racing, just epic conditions, amazing racing. And we also saw the return of Sana Kant, the world champion in the women's field. Um, thrilling race at Yarmarket Market Cross where she outsprinted Lois Sells for the win. And Gavre, uh, Matthew Vanderpoel, again putting on a clinic. Go watch these races on flowbikes.com or the Flow Sports app. Um, just can't miss cross racing. What are we looking ahead to this weekend, Michael? We have the fourth round of the World Cups coming up in Czechia uh, to Bor. And then uh, riders are going to have a massive thousand kilometer transfer to another De Veve series, Flandrian Cross, personally one of my favorite cycle cross races of the year. Um, and I think that some Americans are going to show up for, to these races. Yeah, exciting that the North American women will be traveling back across the pond. Magalie Rochette, Ellen Noble, Katie Keogh, uh, mixing it up with the best women in the world. These international women's races are so exciting. You never know who's going to win. Uh, week in, week out, and hopefully um, we see these racers also make this uh, kind of ridiculous transfer to Belgium. Last year we saw an awesome battle between um, uh, Ellen Noble, Katie Compton, and Sana Kant at Hama. Yeah, uh, Flandrian Cross was such a good race last year. Ellen Noble, Katie Compton, the two Americans were just leading the international women's field of cyclocross throughout this entire race. Sana Kant ended up pulling one over on both of them on the last lap, but such a good battle. I know after the uh, Pan Am Championships, we are definitely looking forward to seeing our women back over in Europe. And then on the men's side, can anyone do anything about Matthew Vanderpool? There may be one person, one small glimmer of hope. I'm calling him Tom Pidcock. He's from oh. Great Britain. He has been racing the under 23 races most of this season in our uh, international rankings on the site. We have him ranked down at 22nd, but he will be moving up. He was fourth at Gavre, put in an incredible ride. He was attacking the field at Yarmarket Cross. So, you know, there's some new challengers coming up. I don't think anybody is really ready to take on Vanderpool quite yet. Um, but watching Matthew Vanderpool do what Matthew Vanderpool does is always worth tuning in for. Again, check it out on flowbikes.com and the Flow Sports app. Now, the big debate. Michael, we were in Italy uh, covering Il Lombardia, previewing the Giro d'Italia courses, and you know, we rode down the descent of the Sermano where Lawrence de Plus fell over the guardrail. Um, we rode up the Gavia Pass where Andy Hampston rode through a blizzard to take the, you know, secure victory at the 1988 Giro d'Italia. And it got us talking about um, if cycling is, if these iconic moments in the sport, these, you know, thrilling, uh, clips and images if we're not going to have them anymore as you know the sport becomes more professionalized uh, more risk averse and prone to s safeguarding the riders <laughs> <laughs> well uh, one way to look at it uh, essentially riding down the descent after the Miro de Sermano where we saw uh, Lawrence de Plus last year did flip over the guardrail and fall 30 feet I may have gone on a little bit of a rant about how professional cycling is just entirely too dangerous in its um, yeah, current state. We should really be seeing riders safeguarded a little bit more. And uh, the Lawrence de Plus crash really was a uh, just case in point for me. I don't understand why a race can't just put barriers at the end of a blind turn on a descent where you literally have no room for margin. because. You know, thankfully, Duplus was okay, but this could have been a much different story. 
Ian, uh, being the callous, cr crotchety old bike racer that he is, I'm sure he wishes that everybody would still race in leather hairnets instead of proper helmets. There is an argument to be made that helmets don't ma actually make you safer, but... Ooh, let's go down <laughs> this in a future let's, show. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's, let's start with weather conditions. Because okay. we rode up the Gavia Pass, you know, this climb isn't even open to racers who go over it in the Giro d'Italia. We're going to see it in the 2019 edition of this race, which will be broadcast live and on demand on Flow Bikes. You know, are we going to see a race like that again in the future? You know, this remains one of, you know, the most iconic, revered days in cycling history. But, you know, in the 2013 edition of Milan San Remo, a blizzard blew in, you know, racers were getting covered with ice. We saw pictures of Taylor Finney on social media with his whole helmet covered in ice. They ended up uh, canceling the race, putting all the riders in buses, letting them warm up, change clothes, get a cup of hot tea, routing them around the mountains, and then getting back on their bikes so they could finish the race, which was won by Gerald, Gerard, Gerald Chulek. Um, but I, I, I still think, A, they should have gone up and over the mountain no matter uh, if they had to walk or, you know, build snow caves or whatever else to get over it. And B, it, le it, led, <laughs> it led to the creation of, what is it, the Extreme Weather uh, Protocol, which is now a set of rules in place to um, safeguard riders from extreme weather conditions. And, you know, with these rules in place, we may no longer um, see the sorts of riders versus the elements battles that we've had in the past. And rightfully so, because honestly, the Hampstead descent coming off the Gavia was terrifying. I would not wish that on anybody. Frozen brake tracks, you, uh, talk about a small margin of error when your bike actually can't stop. Riders were having to drag their feet on the ground to maintain a relatively safe uh, speed going blind down a descent. And honestly, it just kind of, makes the sport look a bit messy when you have uh, the Giro and what was it, 2014, coming off the Stelvio when Rigoberto Uran lost the Maglia Rosa because there's this big miscommunication, another blizzard in the Giro. Uh, some riders thought that the descent was going to be neutralized, others didn't. Quintana went faster down the descent than Rigo did. It's just unorganized. I think that the extreme weather protocol was a very, very good step taking the sport to just a more professional level where you don't have ridiculous things like not knowing if a race is neutralized or not because of safety. In my opinion, it is the worst thing to happen to pro bike racing since the introduction of disc brakes. But let's move on to uh, road conditions, which, you know, we're, we're on different sides of this argument as well. You know, in my opinion, it's races like Perry roubaix and, you know, the high mountains coming off of you know, descents like the Tourmalet with dramatic cliff drops that make the sport so compelling and which the racers themselves, you know, talk about dreaming of winning one day. So it's a lot of these, you know, quote unquote, dangerous roads that are actually some of the most compelling places for the sport to take place. Now, sure, we love wet cobblestones at Paris Roubaix. We like the occasional snow bank at the Giro, but my big concern is inconsistencies in the road where you may have miles of a really, really smooth road in a race and then a random pothole that could eat your front wheel. If you've ever watched motorsports, the way that, uh, you know, take MotoGP. I was at the Austin MotoGP race a couple years ago and the start of the race was delayed by over 30 minutes because a walkway over the race was dripping water, creating one puddle on the course. They deployed a fleet of trucks with Epic jet eye rolls. <laughs> they deployed a fleet of trucks with jet powered engines, thank you very much, to dry this part of the course because they did not want to risk a rider hitting the one puddle on the racetrack and causing a massive crash. You know, cobbles, sure, you are expecting a lot of really rough roads. Uh, with unpredictability, but if the UCI can't go out and fix a couple potholes on the race that a rider might hit in a crosswind section, I don't know, that's just kind of reckless endangerment. Yeah, but you've also uh, talked about, you know, putting up netting or padding on these uh, tricky descents and, you know, basically turning 
bike racing into MotoGP. I think there's only so much you can do to safeguard the sport and, you know, racing on these open roads. And, you know, I think by creating conditions that lead the racers to go faster, take more risks, you know, if they know that a corner is going to have some sort of padding or netting, they might even take more risks and make the sport more dangerous. It's sort of like the phenomenon in football where once they, they put helmets on these guys, they started bashing their heads against each other. So it might even be that... You just don't like helmets, do you? <laughs> I do own a hairnet. Uh, it's my mom's. Uh, by trying to make the sport even safer, they might be encouraging riders to take more risks and even making the sport more dangerous. Hmm, a theory. <laughs> uh, you have anything else on this topic? Uh, well, on? now that we're talking about football, let's go into the economics yeah. of this because, you know, it seems like every year the NFL, they roll out more safety uh, rules and regulations to protect their, uh, the players. And this is always met with a lot of uproar. People are saying, oh, you're uh, making a sissy. Why don't you just put two twos on the quarterback? Um, it, this isn't football anymore. But the sport is thriving under rules, keeping the riders as safe as possible. And my, probably the NFL doesn't care that much about the safety of the players. What they do care about is the money that they're making by having the players not injured and benched throughout the whole season. If you have a star quarterback on the bench for the second half of the season, they miss the playoffs, they can't go to the Super Bowl, that is a huge chunk of cash that, A, the players are losing out on for future contracts, teams are losing out on because a lot of people actually just lose interest in the team if their star player is out of commission. And then that trickles down to the league losing money. I think that cycling would prosper under rules protecting all of the riders, especially the star riders, because you don't want to see a pileup that just happens to take out Chris Froome a month before the Tour de France. That's huge money that we're talking about losing. Every little thing that we can do to keep the riders safer preserves the sport and allows it to grow as a result. I mean, the, it was terrible seeing uh, Vincenzo Nibali crash on Alf Duez and, you know, not battle for the yellow jersey and the Tour de France this year, I'll admit. But at the same time, you know, Chris Froome, Nibali, Sagan, these are not only the best bike racers in the sport, but they've become the best bike handlers in the sport. I mean, I think if you look at the evolution of Chris Froome over the past decade, we've seen him have to become an incredible bike handler, an incredibly well-rounded bike racer because of that risk of crashing. And, you know, that's just part of the sport. And, you know, sure, we want to safeguard the riders and we don't want our star riders uh, crashing out, not competing in the biggest events. But, you know, there is, I think, a line there in terms of going too far and not, you know, races are actually safer when you put them on narrow roads that force them to ride single file. And you see most of the crashes on the wide open roads where, you know, the racers are riding 20 abreast and battling for position. So there is a line that can go too far. And at the end of the day, what I would like to see, you know, even though it was a res the extreme weather protocol was a result of uh, the riders' unions. We really do need uh, a stronger riders' union, and and at the end of the day, I think it's for the racers, you know, to make the call. We saw like the end of the Giro d'Italia this year, where the racers decided not to the race because they thought the course was too dangerous. So I don't want to see the sport become more wussified than it already is, but you know, we can give uh, modern day racers their say. You can go to our site and decide who's wrong and who's right by voting in a poll on this very subject or in the YouTube comments below. Um, you can tell us that you side with me, who's right, or with this guy. Yeah, please let us know your thoughts and opinions on the safety in cycling, which direction you would like for it to go. Um, we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you for joining. Bye.